Just that. Okay, I'd like to bring to order the Village of Lake Bluff Sustainability and Community Enhancement Ad Hoc Committee for Monday, February 4th, 2019. Can I get a roll call, please? Certainly. Member Bishop? Here. Member Sorensen? Here. Member Twitchell? Here. Member Johnson? Here. Member Patterson? Here. Co Chair Purrier? Here. Co Chair Renner? Here. You have a quorum. Okay. Um, next up is the consideration of the November 28, 2018 uh, Sustainability and Community Enhancement Committee meeting minutes. Do we have any revisions, comments, questions? Hearing none, can I get a uh, roll call, please? Or is this a voice vote? Or a voice vote, but you need a motion and a second. Okay, I need a motion. So moved. Second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. All right. Next up is uh, we will, the, the committee will uh, consider non-agenda items from anyone uh, here to discuss something that's not on the agenda tonight. Okay. Is there anyone here who wants to speak on something not on the agenda? All right. Then we'll um, consider the order of the meeting. Um, if there's any changes, I don't think we need any. I think we've got good order. So why don't we start? Certainly. So um, one item first, and then we'll be on our corridor and gateway study. This is the um, concerns the backyard chicken um, pilot program that you, was approved uh, about this time last year, which means that it being an annual license, it is time um, to renew that permit. The <coughs> Drown family, 517 Lincoln Avenue, is here with us. They've been keeping chickens on their property continuously since about May or so. And so, um, among other things, we want to give you a chance to um, ask them any questions, uh, satisfy any curiosity, and also the pilot program's terms require that this um, happen before we renew their license. So, if you want to come on forward. So, um, we've given you some photos. Essentially, this is a chance for you to answer, ask any questions you like um, about the criteria or otherwise, and then um, whenever you're ready um, you can move to recommend that the permit be renewed or, or not be renewed okay I think the pictures you're seeing are the ones from our garage that um, oh those are no those are from the backyard here let me give you the garage <laughs> pictures <laughs> we're jumping ahead a little bit yes or rather I am lagging behind a little bit Not cooperating. So that's, so, the, that's the indoor coop for when it gets too cold. We like bring last week, we had that. Bring them yeah. inside just to keep <laughs> them extra warm. We are the the breed that we have. They're really actually good at like zero. But anything we, I mean, we're spoiling them a little bit. Bring them in <laughs> if it's like twenty or below at night, and that during the day, you know, the only they don't really love the snow, but they don't uh, mind the cold. So they still run around and dig around. What breed is it again? It, they're called Buff Orpingtons. So they're the big, fluffy, um, like golden. They're very handsome the, chickens. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> very friendly. Yeah. <laughs> Are they still laying now that it's cold? They have been. Yep. yep. Like great. crazy. Yep. They took a break like right around Christmas. I'm not sure what that was about. Because <laughs> I was planning on giving them as gifts. <laughs> Probably why. <laughs> but pretty consistent, yeah. And how has it been overall? Have overall, been it's been really Excellent. easy. Easier, actually, than I thought. They're, you know, they're very instinctual, so they know when it's time to go to bed. They put themselves to sleep. We just kind of, you know, close them in, and um, once it gets dark, and then we let them out in the morning, and they're out all day long. Um, we've had zero predators, mm -hmm. like not even, not, not even, even anything hawk. scratching, nothing. <laughs> we had, a, one time we had, um, crows and i thought are oh, the crows you know they were making a lot of noise and then i did a little research and apparently crows um warn chickens that there are hawks in the area oh mm. that's so, amazing. yeah so but they never came in the we've never had a hawk in the yard and no you know skunks or anything so so you have three chickens we had three we lost one um and we're not really even sure why she just kind of keeled over 
Like a heart attack, most likely. Yeah, we had mm -hmm. her looked at, and there was nothing significant wrong with her. They just, mm -hmm. um, they just said sometimes, you know. So do you think three's ideal, or do you think I five's? think three is ideal. Or four. Two is not, I think, I, I worry about having two only because if another one, if something happens to another one, they can't, I really don't, wouldn't, I really don't think they'd be happy by themselves. So I think they'd have to have a friend. Um, so we'll probably get another one once we can trust the weather's not going to be so, <coughs> so cold. Do they have names? They do. <laughs> <laughs> Becky. Um, Scary cat. Scary cat. And Zinni was the one that we lost, and she was, uh, she was awesome. She had a big floppy little. <laughs> so we're sad, but. But you can pick them up. The kids play with them. I mean, yeah. they're, they're great. The dog. Dog gets along gets with them. Gets along with them. She goes out in the backyard with them and doesn't chase them or anything. So. They're lovely. They are. Now, do you get wow. them as chicks? Or? We got them. Um, they, they were about 14 weeks old, oh. and they they came in mail. <laughs> and we, uh, yeah, it was <laughs> undignified. And yeah. they uh, Amazon they took Prime. Them. Yeah, well, yeah, <laughs> yeah. We had to go pick them up and from the post. It was interesting, but they. Um, we got them at 14 weeks in like right about the beginning of June and they started laying eggs about um, mid-August. So okay. we watched them kind of, you know, and they were a little feistier when, before they started laying and now they're extremely, they would, they would walk in the back door if we let them. Mm -hmm. They just like to be around and they jump up and like look at us through the kitchen window. And <laughs> <laughs> they're very entertaining, very entertaining. We love them. <laughs> So do we uh, need I have a one question. Oh, yeah, go. I, I'm trying to recall, but originally in your application, it was uh, the neighbor to the east just behind you yeah. had originally raised a little bit of concern, and they travel a lot. Yeah. It, have you talked with them, or have they had any feedback we or anything? We haven't really talked to them. We don't really ever see them. Okay. Yeah. Um, I think that was the only one that I remember yeah. was just yeah. mildly And they're really, they really are quiet. I mean, they're quieter than the crows. Mm -hmm. You know, they... Um, you know, sometimes in the morning they make a little noise when they're, you know, when they get up before us. But um, it's just a, you know, it's just a little clucking noise. It's not a rooster noise by any means. So, um, but yeah, we haven't had anybody approach us with any issues. Okay. Great. Wow. Nice. I move. Go ahead. That we extend or issue a new permit, whatever it needs to be. Great. ASAP. <laughs> second. Okay. Second. Mm -hmm. One call. Vote. Uh, yeah, you want to do a roll call? We'll yeah. Do that for you. Roll call. Okay. Sure. <coughs> Member Bishop. Yes. Member Sorensen. Yes. Member Twitchell. Yes. Member Patterson. Yes. Member Johnson. Yes. Co-chair Perrier. Yes. Co-chair Renner. Yes. Motion carries. Thank you. Awesome. All right. Thank, Thank you. you very much. <laughs> when, do, what, when do we get our <laughs> eggs? Good night. <laughs> Egg bribery. Yeah, egg bribery. <laughs> breakfast at the, <laughs> breakfast at the <laughs> grounds. I have a question. Do they, um, as, when they come to us for a new license, is there a charge to them? Sure, so there's a, um, a $50 application fee on the first issuance. Um, in this case, we didn't assess that for the renewal. And I was wondering, do you think it's necessary to renew every year? It was a pilot program. I, I was wondering if we could think yes. about extending that at least to two or three years for people. I, I think the, the village board was wanted to collect data. They wanted to hear the feedback. Um, I, would, I think that's the goal, uh, and I'm not opposed to extending it to two years, but I think that we're also hoping for a few more applications just to, you can't, off one data point, just to see. Right. But I think that um, eventually at this point, I'm thinking that the number of applications that we would have in the village will be small. And I just don't, we didn't think it was gonna be an issue, but with just a limited number of applicants. Yeah. When, when you look at the kind of houses that our villages would put in and the way that they treat them like family, it doesn't appear to be something that, we don't even license dogs anymore, so. That's, that was what I was thinking, that we could make it easier for the people when they obviously love their chickens. I love that. <laughs> and taking care of them. And, yeah. 
Well, perhaps let's bring that up before the next renewal, whether we want to uh, take it. Now, remind me too, the, the window for the applications, we have windows, right? Um, not as such. Okay. Um, you know, if, if someone's interested in doing it, they would apply and then we would, we would bring that to you. Okay. We publish some advisory windows just to make sure people hit the meetings and, and have Okay, so if two months us. from now someone came forward in the spring. They could okay. just come. come There's still time, time, Sophie. <laughs> <laughs> so this is, this is February, so this is an ideal time to bring this up because apparently you have to get your chicken order in in time. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. as they said, it takes a while for the chickens to settle in, grow a little bit, and then start laying the eggs. Right. Right. Well, if anyone's watching, we're open for applications. There you go. <laughs> I do want to point out before we move on to the study, we did have a, um, a B pilot program application we thought would be forthcoming to you at this meeting. Mm -hmm. um, that person has decided to withdraw their application. So their neighbors are getting a nice new hot tub and they were worried that of course, the bees may use that as a source of water since it's right there. Mm. Oh. Um, not, a, not, you know, probably a wise decision, all things considered. So, mm. um, so we will continue to look for bee um, pilot participants as well. Mm -hmm. Good. Um, with that said, we have Jody Mariano, Cliff Miller here um, to talk about the final workshop of the corridor and gateway beautification study. So. Um, kind of on our behalf, I do want to apologize for getting this draft circulated. I'm cutting a little close. Um, as you know, the last couple of weeks have been um, challenging for keep a lot of our staff um, to, to get some time to be able to get um, a deep review. But I'm glad we got that out to, to you and the other stakeholders in the study. Um, we have, um, <clears throat> depending on how our conversation goes, um, what we're suggesting as staff is to leave about a 10-day period for these stakeholders to get back written commentary as well. So the next Wednesday, um, at that point, we'll take their commentary, work on a final draft, and bring that to you for recommendation in March. Again, um, depending on the, how this workshop goes. So with that. Great, thank you, thank you all for having us tonight. Um, we're uh, so happy to come back and present this to you. And uh, we've really appreciated sort of this um, partnership that we've had between the SEC group and also you know, the public and other stakeholders. So with that, I'm just gonna pass around a sign-in sheet because we wanna make sure we still capture everybody who is participating. Um, as a follow-up to where we left off the last time, um, you might recall when we had an, our meeting before the holidays, uh, we looked at some concepts and we also looked at an outline for what we called the playbook. And so this was the outline we reviewed back in October. Um, and we, you know, we, we kind of, you know, all came around this idea that we would uh, treat this as a concept plan for Route 176, but also um, break it up into typologies that down near number five, um, could be pulled apart so that as projects came forward to treat the gateway entry signs or roadway intersections, uh, this is developed sort of with those things in mind so that you can pick and choose and plug and play as it makes sense for the village moving forward. Um, so we spent some time talking about implementation, building on some of the great stuff that has already been happening with Elbola and, and other groups in town. Um, and uh, with that, we, um, prepared this draft uh, in collaboration with uh, Landscape Artistry, Cliff, who's here with me tonight, and also working closely with village staff. And so, just as Glenn mentioned, um, we realize that um, you've only just seen this over the weekend, and so we really just wanted to treat today as an opportunity to walk you through how this playbook is organized and just introduce you to, um, to some of the items in here and then to answer any questions you might have, but then we recognize that there will be some time to review it and we'll welcome your comments today and later as well. Um, any questions before I kind of head into this regarding process or anything? Okay, so the way that this is organized is, um, you know, we talked the last time about have, starting this off with a letter. This playbook is something that's going to be um, recommended to the board for their approval adoption. And so um, this is a letter that was drafted uh, as a way for all of us to sort of recognize that we've all been working together um, with stakeholders and staff and committee to uh, produce this document. So um, that's the way that this report kicks off. And then the way that the report is organized <clears throat> is um, after the letter, we talk about the introduction and the purpose of the playbook, what it's about, 
um, the planning process and the goals of the committee. And then we get into some of the existing landscape identities. The, you remember all the different typologies we looked at and all of Cliff's wonderful photographs of those things. Um, and then we'll get into the proposed concepts and um, typologies. And then we get into sort of the nitty gritty of the plant list and the best practices and next steps. Um, and then of course, meeting summaries from the past uh, two times that we, that we met together. So I'm gonna go through, but I'm not gonna read it all, but please stop me if there's something that you wanna discuss further and we'll, um, we'll take notes as we go along. So as you recall, the purpose of all of this really is to identify sort of village-wide what's happening from a landscape perspective, what are the patterns of the existing landscape and how can we capitalize on that as we think about corridor landscape improvements, um, specifically looking at Route 176. Um, these are some views on sunnier, warmer days and um, this is something that we would like everyone to take um, time after the meeting to, to review. Uh, the initiatives of all of the various stakeholders who have been actively participating in the use and management and maintenance of the corridors today. So I'm not gonna read it all, but I, I would invite um, any comments because I think these are the things that really make this playbook so special is that really we're capitalizing on the great work that's already been happening um, by all of the stakeholders that are listed here and also in the room. <clears throat> um, these maps I know you're familiar with, these identify the um, property ownership and then focusing in on our section of Rockland Road between the railroad and also Green Bay Road. Uh, the <clears throat> existing landscape identity, these are the um, items that we looked at together as far as how the patterns um, sort of are viewed and perceived today. So these are the graphics that depict those different patterns and you might recall the red represents where forest land is, the brown represents the scrub woodland areas. Those are the areas we don't want to, to perpetuate. We want to replace those with um, some of the great stuff that's happening beyond. The orange represents savanna, the, the green represents tree lawn, the dark green. Yellow is prairie and then wetland is in sort of that greenish blue. Um, so what we've done here is we've just partnered up a description of what each of those typologies is with the dominant species. So the dominant species that are listed here in all of the subsequent pages are organized by trees, shrubs, and then the herbaceous layer. So whatever is here, we want to continue to perpetuate. Whatever is not here, for instance, invasive species, we, we want them out of there because we want to you know, continue um, to, to perpetuate these plant lists. <clears throat> um, so you've seen all this before. Okay, so as far as the corridor concepts, um, this page identifies one of the thematic items that we want to suggest is something that can be carried forward and really set Lake Bluff apart as a, a distinct um, landscape as people come into the community from the outsides. You, Lake, Lake Bluff already has split rail fencing. We have some sections of prairie and so the, the thinking was to merge the prairie species with the split rail fencing to create sort of this um, gateway entry into the, into the community. A um, couple of things, what that does is it uh, minimizes the maintenance so that we're not having to mow an edge around individual fence posts and it also kind of partners up a structural element being the fence with the landscape element being the, the prairie and the herbaceous layers. And Cliff has some great drawings that show what those things look like. <clears throat> uh, this is the Route 176 concept. Cliff, just jump in whenever you feel like you need to. Oh, I like what you're saying. <laughs> okay. Uh, so this is the corridor concept and the items that are um, along 176 that have already been, um, is this gonna work? So there are areas already along this, um, you know, northern section of 176 that Albola has already um, eradicated buckthorn and invasive species and it's providing these wonderful views into the golf course. And these are some of the things that we wanna um, continue um, to recommend on the corridors is that wherever there's a great view beyond, 
Let's capitalize on that, because that's part of what makes this so special. Uh, so this also, just as a refresher, um, you know, we've identified existing trees. Um, we've identified the scrub woodland is sort of this dark brown. The orange is savanna. Um, the blue, obviously, are our bodies of water. Um, the split rail fencing is identified here in sort of these, you know, black lines with the with the boxes on either end along the roadway. And then the yellow represents drifts of native grasses, perennials, and forbs, um, kind of hugging those uh, fencing um, products. The existing trees are these light green. The proposed trees are darker greens. And they're um, in naturalized drifts, so that you know, they provide some structure and backdrop to the drifts of um, grasses and perennials. And they also provide open views to the landscapes beyond. One thing I would like to point out is that this is strictly conceptual. The concept and the look, this drawing, it's not meant to be a final plan or actually represent what we might do in the field other than conceptually. In other words, if you went out and located the proposed trees on this map out there, it may not work as uh, specifically as uh, intended by an actual drawing, uh, construction drawing. So this is conceptual. That's right, yeah, and just to kind of piggyback off of that, we've been doing all of this based on air photographs, and so once you get out there with, you know, actual drawings, we have an idea where the right-of-way is. It's shown with the red line here, but this is all based on the village's GIS. So to Cliff's point, absolutely, these things would want to be verified once um, the village moves forward with construction. Do you want to speak to how this is laid out, Cliff? Uh, sure. This is uh, looking west on uh, 176 from just past the uh, wetland and the, and the uh, house that's on the north side there. Uh, you can see the fences on right and left, the split rail that's already part of the village signature being carried in sections to the west. Those areas for maintenance reasons and otherwise are surrounded with native, uh, primarily prairie and savanna plantings. Uh, you can see on the right where we're already sort of showing some of the openings that Open Lands has already worked towards. Uh, but kind of one of the important things here is originally when the work to the south was done, when the tunnel was built and that was treed in groves, um, all of those trees are primarily gone. Most of them failed for a variety of reasons. So you can see one of the things we're proposing is uh, replanting those you know, I know there's a concern about the soils, but uh, we will need to shift tree species. But the idea would be to sort of marry left to right on this and get back to a more continuous look. Uh, so the grouping, so you see the road, the gravel edges, the swale, the fencing, and the naturalistic uh, presentation of prairie grasses and savanna. This is a cross section of the same. Uh, this is, again, the south side of the street. You can see the tree that have, are shown as being planted. There are a few there, just not enough. Uh, so that's the idea is that you have kind of an open view to the path, but there's a little bit more uh, separation through the placement of tree groupings. There's a little bit more of a feel of intimacy on that path in areas without creating safety issues. Uh, and then it also, to the south, shows working into those scrub shrub areas and opening some of that uh, to take advantage, because really the property goes you know, across the path, up the hill to West Terrace, and also flattens out as you get to the city, or the village land, I should say. So this is one cross-section, but the concept remains the same throughout the entire westbound stretch. And something to point out is that, you know, in our work with um, the roadway agencies, you know, visibility needs to be um, kept open and, and clear and safe. And so there are some guidelines here that identify, and I think this is also common with what we heard from Public Works with regard to how they like to maintain space against the bike path, is that we keep a three foot wide mown edge on either side of the bike path that kind of keeps views open. Likewise, whenever we have the roadway condition, the edging um, on the side of the road is to have an at least three foot wide mown path. 
and that the plantings and the fencing should not get taller than three feet. So again, we want to keep this clear and open, but still, you know, beautiful and flowering and all that great stuff. But safety always first. Um, gateway entry signage. So these are some of those typologies that we talked about. So, you know, this, of course, is an example of one of Lake Bluff's um, handsome new sign panels. And this is an area here that show, demonstrates how in concept that could be planted. So in this specific location, we're butting up against wetland. Um, we have identified some locations for um, some uh, shrub plantings and some tree plantings. And then the purple represents drifts of perennials. Um, these would be more, um, uh, more flowering, more full of color. And so we've identified some um, plantings that you know we think could work well. Um, something about plantings that you know we could talk more about with you all is um, we heard at the last couple of meetings a desire for um, all native plantings. Um, we do have some experience working with all native plantings along roadsides because as you know they need to be able to tolerate the de-icing salts and all the urban pollutants that get thrown at it. So um, all of the plantings that you see in this report today um, meet both of those criteria. They're tolerant of those things and they're also uh, native. Uh, the roadway intersections, again, this is the, a section looking at um, Green Bay Road at 176. So, you know, this is, you know, obviously what it looks like today. Um, the orange represents savanna. There's, of course, also more savanna in these sections down here. But this shows where the existing fence line is today and how we're sort of wrapping that with those drifts of the native grasses, perennials, and forbs. <clears throat> um, there was some discussion about privacy screening. The photo at the top is a photo that I'm sure everybody's very familiar with. This is what it looks like when the invasives and the buckthorn kind of take over. Um, some alternatives as to what can be planted in its place. And this would have to be looked at on a case-by-case -case basis because um, we need to make sure that we don't encroach onto sidewalks and things like that. So we've provided a list of upright screening trees and shrubs that could be considered. Um, this is an example of one type of tree, an eastern red cedar. Um, but we would like to um, uh, suggest that the community considers alternatives to the buckthorn, of course. Um, so a couple of things about best practices. Um, you know, uh, we talked a little bit about this the last time, but the steps that uh, stakeholders and the village can take in moving forward with developing the corridor landscapes. Um, you know, first analyzing the site, just like Cliff mentioned. Um, it's about understanding what the conditions are, um, you know, what the soil conditions are, the so solar orientation, how the water moves, um, all of those things. And then where we are on um, roadway jurisdiction, um, getting the appropriate permits. We heard f positive things, I think, from IDOT and Lake County DOT at the first meeting that they um, were supportive of these concepts. So I think that we would find that they'd be great partners um, with us on these things. Um, and then, of course, marking the high quality species that want to be protected, marking the things that need to be removed. And then as we get into landscape removals and preparing the sites, um, it's, you know, about removing the invasive species and then applying weed management. You can't just remove buckthorn once and be done with it. It, of course, takes a lot of um, going back after, which I know Open Lands knows all too well. Um, and then plant selection and landscape plantings, um, you know, uh, determining the, what's, what's available from a plant perspective, um, selecting the desired plant material to fit with the soil and the solar conditions and the drainage conditions and then installing the plantings. And plant installations, of course, would vary based on um, how they come out of the nursery, whether they're seed or containerized, as you know. So those would be um, looked at in a case-by-case basis. And then how these things are maintained over time, um, uh, evaluating the plant growth um, you know, year to year and monitoring for the plant health, um, managing the weed growth, and then supplementing as required. Now, within each of these four categories, there's lots of room for volunteerism and, and, and community members to get involved, which I think is already happening from Open Land's perspective, too. And so we really would encourage that to continue, because there's just tremendous opportunities with um, you know, building support and interest and education um, through that. Uh, plant lists are here. And so these um, are also similar to what we looked at on the previous pages, but this kind of collects it all onto one page. Um, it's organized by trees, shrubs, 
um, shrubs in two forms. Shrubs as a shrub copse, which um, I think was a term I never learned until I started working with Cliff, but a copse is sort of a grouping of shrubs that kind of happen in drifts uh, versus shrub screening, which is something that happens in more of a vertical pattern to provide um, uh, privacy screening. And then on the right-hand side of the page, um, these are um, seed mixes that IDOT uh, uh, has approved for roadside landscapes. Um, and there are a few different seed mixes. The one on top is just a salt-tolerant roadside mix, so that would look like lawn but can handle the salts. Um, at the second one is a low-profile native mixture, so those are more grassy things, but they are three feet tall, max. And then the one on the bottom is um, Forbes with annuals, so it will have more of a flowering appearance. With all of these, I will say the IDOT seed mixes are not set in stone. IDOT has always entertained additions to this mix, so if there were ever a desire to, you know, add another variety of coneflower or to, you know, do something with these mixes, they entertain those things. We've had good experience in the past, but um, for simplicity's sake, we thought we would start with what they recognize and they're very familiar with. Is that first grouping the salt tolerant ones? Are those natives? Uh, fescue is native. Ryegrass is not. Do you know? Uh, it depends on the selections. So Some there, of the there are options. Yeah, a that lot are of the yeah. base. Uh, graminoids or grasses for some of the IDOT mixes are non-native forms mm -hmm. that are a little bit, as they see it, more durable. Mm -hmm. um, I've never planted one of these mixes, but I've dealt with them dozens of times, and by that I just mean that they're always manipulated. I would always recommend that manipulations to these lists. Jody's just got them in there as, you know, a starting point to work from because IDOT obviously controls a lot of this right away, and that would be our starting point. But I've never installed a list as shown on this paper uh, directly because of that. A lot of non-natives, their balances aren't quite right. And uh, so, Larry, you probably have some familiarity with that in well, IDOT. I was thinking that IDOT doesn't really control a whole lot of Real estate. Do they look how far into the uh, away from the curve do they control? So these mixtures look really well, of course they're okay, but um, yeah, I, the gravenoids are a little weak. They climbed to be too slavishly uh, following the IDA. Well, you see, the whole South is IDA, or a good chunk of it. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, there's that county, <laughs> the bike path, North Shore path that runs through there. Mm -hmm. If you can see by the yellow line, that's a substantial amount of the right of way on the that south side. currently interpreted. Yeah, but you know, having said what I said about, you know, playing with the mixes, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. they're fine with that. Mm -hmm. As long as you show, you know, a reason for it and it's, it's sound in science, they have no problem with changes like this. So these again are a guideline uh, but just like the list for the shrubs and the trees and all that stuff, um, they're site specific when we actually get to the design phase. Uh, all of that you know, may not go together as shown in the broader picture because there's, as Jody said, so many variables. Yeah. Um, so as far as um, next steps, you know, uh, this is kind of our summary page. Um, but what we wanted to capture were some of the great ideas that kind of flowed from that last meeting about how there are all sorts of wonderful opportunities to partner between the village and stakeholder groups on um, the analysis and the installation and the uh, management and the removals of plant materials out there. So. Um, this page is really about that, but you know some items on the right hand side, you know, I, you know it, I can just kind of rattle off here, but one is to continue collaborating um, with open lands to remove invasives and install plantings and to um, you know work with their wonderful um, uh, resources of volunteer groups to continue the work that's happening already today. Um, also, we heard great feedback from the Garden Club during previous meetings about 
um, designing and installing plantings. You know, the gateway signage areas were areas that we targeted early as great opportunities because they're contained and, and kind of, you know, I think tie in well with some of the Garden Club's missions. Um, and then, uh, you know, the, the park district being so close with the golf course nearby, um, lots of opportunities to maybe consider programming and bring people out, bring groups out for educational purposes. Um, and educational opportunities abound. I mean, it's not just limited to the park district, but also local organizations, schools, religious organizations, et cetera. Um, and then, you know, one thing we're a big fan of is there's, all, there's so much great stuff that's already happened out here. Um, and here we are with like a foot of snow on the ground, but whatever we can do to document what's happening, you know, from this point on and share that with the community, whether it's on the, you know, village's website and e newsletters, et cetera, um, it's a great story to tell. And I feel like we're, you know, sort of just, we're getting started, we're catching up to some of the stuff that's already been happening, but um, this is, you know, it, it's not too late to start documenting those things and, and sharing them. So, um, with that, the end of the document is um, the summaries from our past meetings. So um, I don't know, with that, I'm, we're happy to talk further about any of the items in here, uh, but we just wanted to open it up to, to discussion at this point. So is the idea that 176 would be sort of a pilot, that that would be the place to start? Yeah, that's right. We, when we- Because Lebola's made so much traction there already. That's correct. Yeah, when we initially um, were asked to, um, to prepare this assignment with the village, it was sort of with 176 in mind, but also taking a broader look to see how 176 fits into the rest of the village. It also happens to be our greatest opportunity and highest traffic zone. Right, for sure. So, you know, I think we're yeah. all aware and have driven by it a million times. Uh, what a great opportunity, and it's rare to have that opportunity. And it's similar to what we have Sheridan Road coming in from that way. But this area, all the pieces are in place. They just need to be tweaked. Uh, I think it's a great uh, opportunity we have here to have, you know. It'll be subtle in the long run. Ideally, you'd never even know we did it 10 years from now if we do do this and move towards, and of course, what Open Lands has already done. Um, so that's the idea, is to start in that corridor and carry that entrance right up to Green Bay Road. Right, so would it extend south, you know, across the bike path to where it is really shrubby, um, sort of blocking the, the development? Would we look at removing the, all the buckthorn in there as well and putting in um, those different type of screening plants? Would it well, go that far south? Or it would could. it just be really narrowly straddling oh, no, the road? Part of the reason for grabbing the views to the north through the golf course and all that is to take advantage of the expansiveness right. of that. Right, that's definitely the more exciting so, side. If you look at the cross well, section, well, yeah. yes and no. I mean, but I spend a lot of time on the bike path. Yeah. <laughs> so, well, yeah. the, benefit of, the benefit of the south side is you start out in Woodland and then you have this ridge, you know, it's a slope there. Right, for sure. So mm -hmm. there's a lot of topography there that we don't have on the north side. Mm -hmm. Obviously, as you get towards Jawa, it turns into a little bit different story, but there's the pond, right. um, which you no longer can see. A lot of you probably remember that that used to be wide open, mm -hmm. and it's just because of management that it's sort of closed in now, mm -hmm. and there can be discussions with them who have always been very cooperative with us to open that back up and take advantage of those views again. So I think the South is limited only by our, um, you know, our ambition, but I would say that we would stay more in that corridor until that's complete and then move in. But you can bet that was always part of our thinking. Okay. And you can see that in the cross section that we showed where we did have plantings on that south. We sort of, we sort of shoved it together so you could see it. Mm -hmm. But that could go, you know, the village owns several acres, 13 acres I think it is to the south over there. Um, you know, it could go all the way up into there. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. It would be really nice. So a couple other things. One, maybe I just read it too fast, but it seems like a great opportunity to reference how an investment in native plants can help mitigate flooding issues mm -hmm. in the village. So I didn't see that. If it was there, I apologize. It's a tiny little sentence, but I think it's worth <laughs> expanding upon because I know that that's an issue here. I think that would be yeah. smart to do. Um, and then I don't know if the playbook's the right place, but 
I think it would be interesting to have goals in there around, you know, if we make this big investment in native plants, are there certifications or pollinator, you know, the con they can conservation at home. I don't yeah. know if they do municipalities, but ways to increase the profile, you know, of the investment. And then I think that can also help um, you do Lake Bluff citizens think, oh, I could do this in my yard too. Mm -hmm. And oh, well, by doing this, all of a sudden it's better for pollinators. It's, but you know, anyway, mm -hmm. I think mm -hmm. it would be interesting to research what are the different kinds of certifications and then to have that as a plan. Um, because it would be great to have signage that says, you know, whatever, Monarch instead Way of, Station. Yeah. Or, right. Exactly, you know, instead right. of Tree, tree City. city. Mm -hmm. Right, yeah. Yeah. same yeah. equivalent. Yeah. But exactly. to have that in mind. Definitely. Right. Okay, sorry to monopolize. Well, be, be, be <laughs> city, be city. All that, all those things. We want chickens. All of them, hummingbirds, monarchs. bees, monarchs. <laughs> yeah, and I think, you know, and so <clears throat> one, of the, one of the best ways to get that information out there, because this is primarily an auto corridor, you know, people are going to be whizzing by at 40 miles an hour. So wherever you can tell that story on um, publications on the website is a great opportunity. Along the bike path, I but think there those is would be the great bike path. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. I have a couple of comments. If, um, yes. uh, obviously, this is conceptual, and um, on the plant lists, uh, one of the things, and, and I went through some of this, and I figure you're going to have more meetings on getting community input on what type of plant list we should have. And to a comment you had, I think once we get this playbook down with <coughs> kind of our playbook or recommended plantings, including trees, that should be incorporated into residents. Mm -hmm. uh, helping them inform them if, as they're doing their own properties, what trees are best, what plantings work about well for the for the for the village. It might even be, you know, we have this uh, street tree program that I did once, where you can pick from trees. We should look at that list to see how that fits with the playbooks. Mm -hmm. So if someone wants a tree, and then they're right away in, in their front yard. Mm -hmm. I also wanted to know if you guys would um, or have looked at climate change with selection of plants or we'll look at that. I know the Chicago Botanical Gardens has their trees for 2050 mm -hmm. and they look at, and most of them are native, but some of them are not, mm -hmm. but looking at um, the wide range of temperatures that we can have, that we have had, because it's not only that we're looking at warmer temperatures, but we're also looking at wilder swings and lower temperatures, mm -hmm. uh, droughts and then flooding so I think that as we look at this playbook for the future, I would hope that we would look at plants that would work 20 years from now, 30 years from now, because these trees have long lives to them mm -hmm. in terms of pest resistance. Um, as far as the conceptual on the, on the plan, I thought um, there were more opportunities around the uh, public works entrance to do more around that area. Um, there's a lot of mm -hmm. open kind of grassy areas there that could that could have more done with them. Um, yeah, just down by that, that pond area. Mm -hmm. There's that whole area behind there, yeah, and to the left behind that. The total upper Yeah, grassy. there's just a lot of opportunities there to, to enhance that. Um, also was thinking about the, the each end of this, um, whether there's an opportunity to create more of a gateway feel, especially at Green Bay. I know we've had some studies in the past by Tesca and others which besides the split rail fence, maybe did more of a four corners with plantings, maybe some brickwork, some stone. I don't know if there's more of a way to, to look at those, those entry points even further than you have. Like the, for instance, there's might be an opportunity for a tree there in that corner um, uh, on the, um, it'd be the south uh, west corner there. There's a little grass area. Just, just general ideas, general thoughts. Yes, yeah. right there, that little grass corner. There's also a number of trees along that whole area there that are dying or in poor condition because they planted them underneath the power lines and they've cut them. So there's opportunities to move them back from the power lines and to do more. I should talk and speak to that because I appreciate it. And, and by the way, I know that past um, studies have been done for this intersection. It wasn't Tesca. Um, but we've seen some of those other studies that were done, and um, they were pretty formal. 
Um, the approach, that the design direction that we took, and we're happy to talk about this further, is, um, well, a couple of things. One, we really only have property on these three corners to do, to do anything. There's a residence here at the northeast, which comes up very close to the right of way, which is shown with this red dash line. Um, and so we're looking for opportunities to uh, keep with sort of this um, casual native landscape feel that it's natural, that it doesn't look like it's something that was just kind of plunked down, um, but something that's in keeping with Lake Bluff's identity and character. And so working with your existing split rail fence, which is really very attractive, but then pulling the drifts of planting sort of, you know, on, hopping on either side of the sidewalk, um, and creating these, you know, curvilinear spaces for the lawn on, on either side, and then tying the tree plantings back into what's happening beyond them. So it looks like it's sort of always been here. We took the approach that we didn't want anything that sort of appeared too forced. Um, but we're happy to, you know, talk further if you're looking for something that's more formal. But, you know, looking at the pier communities along the North Shore, I feel like you see a lot of brick piers and limestone caps and, and signs, and, and I think I don't know, it was just me, but Cliff jump in. I feel like part of what's so special about Lake Bluff is that you don't need some of that stuff because what's beyond is just irreplaceable. I mean, it's like that view to Crabtree Farm or the view across the golf course or the view to Jawa. I mean, stuff is stunning, you know? I think we that's did. part of what I really like about what you guys have done is that the showcase is the native plants and the vistas, and I think that's really great. I think it's hard to... to it's hard to explain to people that when you're talking about prairie plantings or mm -hmm. small copses and gatherings that you can actually have a vista. You know, we don't, we don't mm -hmm. perceive it that way. But I'm, is, is you're talking about alternatives and maybe a more formalized perspective. I'm, I'm just mentally, I drove down Green Bay Road to Green Bay and Deer Path, which is lined with walls and mm -hmm. evergreens and it's very formal and it's lovely in its own way but it it's not welcoming in the way that this would be perceived as welcoming nor does it have any view at all and i think the views are something that are really um, unique to a north shore community mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. one of the issues we had to to express what you had brought up about the entrance signs is you know, we looked at the fact that the actual signage itself could have its own rhythm, you know, the story, as you said, the four corners type thing. The biggest problem we have with that from a design perspective is that each area is so vastly different. Mm -hmm. Some of them, we have absolutely no room. You know, like at the South Green, when you're coming north on Green Bay Road, that one, there's really not a room to pull, there's a lot of room to pull something off. Coming southbound on Green Bay Road at the signage to the village. You know, it drops down, the hill does there, and immediately you're into Buckthorn. Um, so some of the areas, like on this approach, we can have a real profound effect, but when you get to the Green Bay, north and south, those require completely different treatments. So while the only thing that we really can have that's continuous on that is structure, and that's what you, you know, that's what you brought up, currently it's the signage. And could other things be added? Sure. However, you're in right of ways with some of that stuff, so it has to be with, you know, a grain of salt. We have to have all these kind of things checked out before we could do that. But the beginning is the signage itself, and certainly we could develop a rhythm, uh, whether it be a little bit more formalized where the plantings are gathered, whether they're, you know, they still can be native. However, we want to do it, but the conditions in each one of those signs is so different. It's hard to create a rhythm out of them other than the signs themselves. And I, I, I think, you know, I'm not talking about like a wall. What I was thinking is just some way as we, and we talked about this in different meetings about signage and, and presence and knowing you've entered Lake Bluff. And I think this, this whole corridor really does that. I mean, this, the, the vision you've shown for that. I'm just saying at certain points, there might be opportunities. It might be just a tiered bed. It might be just, you take that split rail and you, and you, and you put one down, I'm, and I'm not a landscaper, but just a way to define certain points as kind of a little bit of a wayfinding from rather than the whole rhythm all along to know that you've transitioned a little bit at certain points in town. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I was, Go ahead. As the, um, the naming of your um, native grasses as drifts seems so appropriate because native plants do drift yeah. So 
how often do we need to come back, review the original plan, so that we're containing our drifts yes. as we want them? I'm so glad you asked that, because um, it's in the text, and, and I want to point it out, because um, we've worked with other communities who have done this sort of thing, and <clears throat> one of the things that's so important is uh, installing mowing stakes so that you know, so that Public Works or whoever is maintaining understands where to mow. Mm -hmm. And once a few of those passes happen, and you can see a great example of this if you drive up on uh, Sheridan Road near the Fort Sheridan Cemetery on the east side of the street, um, there are these curvilinear sweeps where it's, it's lawn between the roadway and the edge of that prairie. And then it's not just a straight shot, but it's got these really broad sweeping curves. It only happens a couple of spots, but um, using mowing stakes is a way to do that. And as long as you just you know, kind of keep sticking to the shape and the mowing, and, and it can fluctuate a little bit. There's no harm in it drifting a little bit, but I think that's where that three foot offset is so important to make sure we you know, maintain that visibility and that openness. Before we keep going, I did want to come back um, with two comments and your comments, Brian. So uh, the first, as far as um, how we communicate this to private property owners, residences, um, certainly there's a role in our publications. Um, I, I think at one point we've thought internally, you know, there's only maybe 30 or 40 private property owners along these corridors in total. So do you just drop off? 30 or 40 copies of the plan, and you guarantee that people have the plant lists. Um, if there's any other ideas out there that are creative, we're happy to hear them. Mm -hmm. um, as far as the plant lists, so you did mention the idea that more public comment might refine these lists. I do want to point out that this, as far as formal process for this plan, we are kind of at the, the end of this. Okay. So there's not much more planned aside from, you know, more time for any public comment or comment from the stakeholders in the group and then um, potentially vote at your next meeting. So if, there's, if you feel there's a need for well, that, yeah, we can do that. Uh, let me piggyback on that because that was my last comment about the next steps. Um, with this study, how do we get to a point where we can put together, say, a phased implementation plan or a plan that might set the table with certain work that the village would fund, leave some areas open for community development and for the Garden Club and Lobola. How can we get that so it's, it just doesn't end as a study or a master plan or a playbook, but actually goes to something we can send to the board that has a you know, three, four year plan and, a, and budgets that can be budgeted each year to do this and just get it done. Maybe zones oh, of yeah. different areas, yeah, because it's such a big area. Well, what we need to do, you know, normally the next step, this is again conceptual and laying the parameters from which we can move forward. Uh, so the next step from a landscape architectural point of view would be, you know, gather the input from the playbook that we've just presented, but at the same time, start moving forward with an actual design. Once we have a design in place, we could phase it a lot of different ways, but we need to know what it is we're phasing. Certain things will have a lot more impact than others. So you may decide to do those first. I mean, without doing anything out there but putting it in the fence, it's gonna be a very strong impact. Uh, chewing the drifts, opening up, finishing the buckthorn, strong impact. Um, you know, putting in some flowers here and flowers there, not as strong of an impact, but part of the overall picture. Uh, so, so the first thing we need to do from our point of view, is develop a more an actual plan that you can then, you know, review, look at, and once we decide that's the direction we want to go, then we can start looking at what are the steps to get there and what makes the most sense from both a budget, open lands, other volunteers, village. Uh, that's going to have to be determined by a lot more input from that side of the equation. Larry, do you want to do you want to take the podium and? voice anymore or you just got one comment because I want to I want to make sure we give you open time I did have a couple of okay why don't you come up I, I think first and foremost I want to name and address oh, my name is Larry <laughs> McConnor 1014 Foster Avenue and uh, I want to thank this committee for you know, your perseverance here in making this whole thing happen. And uh, 
come back to the, a point two years ago when we actually presented this committee with what you just mentioned, a plan at, for, let's just say, scratching the surface of removing the invasive species, the buckthorn, on just the north side. But it was certainly, you know, in, in my view, that was what got the ball rolling, which brought us here. And, and then thank uh, your teamwork for coming up with a plan that, that as far, from the perspective of Lake Bluff Open Lands is perfect. And doing the south side was something that was sort of beyond our, our, our scope at the time that we, we, we provided you with our initial plan and that was followed up as well. But that included a budget, uh, it included timelines, and, and at that point, a sense of urgency because we had our, our summer interns were, were chosen and experienced and their crack clearing crew. And, and um, you know, that, that was a great opportunity, but I think we, we still have that sort of great opportunity. Winter's the perfect time to do this clearing. And I don't, I don't think the wheels of government are gonna move fast enough to to unleash the immensely powerful forces of Lake Bluff Open Lands uh, on this area right away. But that would be a good idea. And I do wanna say too, uh, I, th I think Cliff just mentioned something with regard to how long uh, uh, these natural areas from seed take. We're looking at a three year timeline before mm -hmm. you can look out and say, man, that's beautiful. Mm -hmm. Like and you do it at, at, on Sheridan Road. By the school. Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah. Well, the, well, that was planted with plugs. Those were yeah, live no, plants when they yeah. went in, a and so that that cheated. So that was like good, like the very next year. Um, but but that is a consideration before you guys permit the wheels of government to take too long. Remember that that like it's still winter. It's still a good time to seed, and it would be great if we could get seed down in some of these areas sooner rather than later. Although I think that that's a little bit. Um, far-fetched because we've got a lot of uh, turf grass to deal with as well. Um, in terms of a big picture, um, I'm wondering if it isn't too late for this report to have, uh, to, to insert something in the preamble that we'd like this to serve as a model for the entire village, that the county has a goal to be buckthorn free by 2022 or something, Bill? It's later. Than well, it's a fan, it's a fantasy, but it sounds it's it's very nice. It's a nice fantasy, but I, I think that that should be when you've got at the last, at the last meeting we talked about tangly oaks and the fact that they actually protect buckthorn because the screening policy the screening characteristics of a buckthorn hedge are so wonderful that they won't permit buckthorn to be taken out. That's really wrong-headed, and I, I think if, if the village had a policy <laughs> saying this is a really specific, horrible invasive species that, that poisons the soil, is putting an end to the next, any future of, of oaks, uh, you know, a, a, a vision statement from the village saying that we're really on board with the concepts that are being enumerated here in this report. Mm -hmm. But, and, and not just for this little, uh, you know, 176 cord, but for the whole village. Um, so that was, that was one thing I wanted to mention, if it's not too late for the, this report to incorporate a, a preamble like that. Um, at our last meeting, I mentioned the potential for a, just a beautiful vista clearing along the Skokie River, bringing some sun in, having appropriate wetland stream bank plantings, that's a real opportunity and it goes a little bit farther north than the scope of this policy uh, or uh, project, but I think that that is great and that, you know, we can't really appreciate right now how fabulous the view to the north is gonna be because all we can see right now is Buckthorn. Mm -hmm. But when it's gone, and, and I think some of the, the plant selections are what we call low profile, we're not talking about Indian grass or big blue stem that are actually gonna obstruct views, but lower, growing plants so that we can really maintain this beautiful view to the north, which, as I say, right now it takes imagination. Um, and one concern that Lake Bluff Open Lands had was um, the amount of green space that is taken up with 
uh, what I'm going to call turf grass or, you know, we talked about low mow grass or, or like a native monoculture, pensedge or <clears throat> northern drop seed or something. But that remains a concern of ours that, it, you know, we really like some assurance that that's not going to be lawn. And, and I suspect uh, Jake would appreciate that not being lawn too. Yeah. Less mowing, <laughs> um, one thing we have to keep in mind, Larry, is um, that to the north, the golf course, which is one of our primary view sheds, is entirely lawn. Uh, the edges of the road are entirely lawn. The edges of the path are entirely lawn. So I understand exactly what you're saying, but we do have some, you know, we do have some issues. One being the amount that's already there. Mm -hmm. uh, so to create a continuity. To meld those two together as well, um, but I understand exactly what you're saying uh, in regards to keeping that as minimum as we can. But if we want to bring the golf course across the road visually, we're going to need lawn, and the question is, how do we do it? Now, given the requirements of the, both the roadside and the bike path, um, it's already there. So it's just a question of where do we have it, where don't. And the thing that we've always looked at, Jody and I, is the ability to create and use the lawn that's there as, as a design tool to create and control vista views, to guide you out in where we want you to see in, to not have it where we don't want you to. So there's a lot of opportunities the lawn presents, but at the same time, entirely understand your concern to keep that as a minimum but we also have to be realistic about the fact that it's the single largest plant community there right mm -hmm. now. So, um, and believe me, I'm big on oh, not having as much as well. And you never know what's gonna happen to the north with the golf course. So there's a lot of factors that are out of our hands. Mm -hmm. I didn't get into the river portion of that, which does tie into the village property, but that's a huge opportunity into itself, mm -hmm. you know, of itself. Um, but it's also a, a huge project, too. Mm -hmm. But I, I thoroughly agree with you that the opportunities there are really strong. Mm -hmm. One thing that is also not addressed is the use of fertilizer on the lawns, on the turf, and how that um, plays into our collective thought. Mm -hmm. And whether we should... Currently, we don't use any. Yeah. Good. No, Perfect. Once a year, the park district does some broadly spray for us. Hmm. That's all we do there. We really try and avoid it. Well, maybe just even addressing yeah, it as a it. as a point. That uh, is used today, and that's something we want to continue. Right. Yeah. And then, um, what about our own parkways uh, as a further on of how it can be used, not just the mm -hmm. 40 people that are along the corridor, the entrance corridors to the community whether we could have something other than turf grass and that and for our plant, plant list would be mm -hmm. used for that. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Going, going back to the timeline, uh, how long would it take to put together a landscape design for this? So um, I guess... Microphone. Oh, sorry. Yep. <laughs> uh, it, it doesn't take long. I think there's a couple of steps that would need to happen first, which would be we need to get a topographical survey done that usually takes, you know, a couple weeks time. And then um, we could talk about process. I think one of the things we could consider doing um, once we have that survey and assuming that the weather would be nice is, you know, we we as a team would want to go out there and walk the property with you all or whomever wants to join us to kind of document what we see out there um, and then put together a concept uh, and then come back and share it with you all. I mean, that could probably happen in the span of, what do you think, Cliff, a couple months or two months maybe? Sure. I mean, ideally, in my opinion, we go out there on the professional side and, and do some preliminary, as you said, investigations and look at things, perhaps even stick some stuff out. Yeah. So just like the playbook, bring it to the third dimension and then have everybody look at it and get a feel and see where it's going. It's entirely dependent on how fast you want to do it. Obviously, it's tough to do that in the weather today, but yeah. you know, by by the beginning of uh, summer, we could easily have all of that, not just a you know conceptual plan tied down to Can an actual money? doable plan, but 
things staked out in the field for you to see so you get an idea of that. One of the biggest questions that we'd have to answer, uh, and this goes to the drifts that Leslie brought up, was, was the fact that we can use native plants a lot of different ways. Mm -hmm. We can have prairie, which is this mix of 100 and something species, or we can use native stands of, that are monoculture or smaller. I mean, think like, uh, you know, not a millennial park. Uh, the stuff that you see down there, we've done it both <clears throat> ways. You can be stronger sometimes by going with less species with more impact and more dramatic. Those, I'm not gonna say are right or wrong, but that's a discussion that we'll have to have that can come out of that, you know. The reason I'm asking this is we talk about the slow wheels. We've got, a, we've got you know, I'm in the design business, so you've got to design, put, put together design. Then you've got to put together a phased kind of implementation plan that might include different groups, either volunteer or some of it coming from the village in terms of cash to put in the split rail fronts and clear out certain areas and do certain gravel. And then putting that, that might be in a phased year, multi-year plan because there's a cost for the design, but I think that the cost of actually and, the, and the, how to do this work and to be able to release some of our volunteer communities to do that work, and we know that it fits within an improved design plan, keeps us going. So, mm -hmm. I, you know, my feeling is I don't want this to, to skip a whole nother year, sure. and we're not, we're not out there really working on a plan mm -hmm. that has, you know, steps and zones for people to work. Sure. I mean, one of the actionable items on this plan today are to continue removing buckthorn. You know, I feel like that, that, is, that is one of the best things that can be done. And if there is a, a group of volunteers willing to do it, um, you know, we know that's step one of any of this. Okay. And is there any, in the process, is there any cost analysis for, you know, budgets and stuff, or is that... So a lot of that depends on labor and materials, right? And so as far as the labor that's been um, applied to removing the buckthorn so far, we understand it's mostly been volunteer. Uh, so um, there, there has been no cost associated with that. I think it all comes down to how we secure the plant materials and how it's installed. If it's installed by village staff, it would carry a different cost than if it was installed by a professional landscaper. So all of those things would be something to, to think about. And even though Open Lands is doing that clearing, we would put a cost on that as well? I think that would be really important because they are doing a huge service to our community, and yeah. I think it would be great to be able to quantify that. Mm -hmm. well, that and, and I think so. there's, the word volunteer only goes so far. The adults are volunteering, but sure. a lot of the work is being done by youngsters who are getting paid. It's a summer job, and it's, mm -hmm. sure. it's a full-time job. Uh, so those are real costs. And yeah. The budgets we came up with two years ago included those costs. Right, but that if that's for a zone, for that budget, like this part, led by your group, costs this amount. Right. This amount done by the village or professional landscapes costs this amount. Then you can, you know, where you're going to go, mm -hmm. and we're all agreed how to how to approach it. Yeah, I think once we have a plan in place, we could figure out exactly how we want to approach those. You know, because obviously. There's going to be lots of different people involved with this. We may even be able to get help from the, you know, county or the state, or uh, you know, open lands from from private donors like we have to the north on Sheridan, happening right now. Mm -hmm. uh, lots of different ways as long as we have a playbook in place. But I think it's important, uh, from my point of view, to put a monetary um, value on all of that work. So when volunteers are doing it, open lands are doing it, or who's ever doing it. You know, we know what it is that they're, you know, in other words, if it's $100,000 and Open Lands is doing it for 20000 then we owe them a big, you know. Add a boy. And, and if we don't quantify that, we would never know that. So anyway, that's how we would typically do it. Because again, we could have the clearing done by a professional group in no time. Rather see Open Lands because they take ownership of it. And I think it's really a powerful thing for the community. And I also think if we go forward with this, with this, you know, and it builds strength as it goes, you're gonna have a lot more people there than just open lands out there. We're gonna get residents who wanna put on the gloves, and it's an opportunity for open lands to, you know, perhaps grow with that as well. well part of our initial plan was that the village work with us and the park district to, to promote it and say, okay, there's gonna be a great big community volunteer day, you know, bring your gloves, we'll provide the loppers, and ship everything and, uh, <laughs> and that, that's exactly 
the way we envision right. and, and bringing the community in uh, so that you know, people can take ownership of it, including with their school-age kids. Mm -hmm. well, I would add to that. <coughs> we had a volunteer work day on Martin Luther King birthday. And it was five below zero, so we canceled it. <laughs> but those of us that are crazy still went. Okay. <laughs> well, the Montessori school thought five degrees is no problem, and we had 20 students in the Montessori school. Oh, so that's awesome. And did a fabulous wow. job. Nice. Middle schools. No, it was Montessori. Forest Bluff. Forest Bluff. But the one, the one yeah. Yeah, yeah. Forest Bluff. Uh, yeah. Yes, middle school, meaning seven and eighth graders, right? Um, and they did a fabulous job. Part of our initial concept here was to involve students yep. in all the schools. All the schools have shown interest. Young families have shown interest. They're coming <coughs> in from Ebola now. Our board will be significantly younger in a year. <laughs> Put it that way. That's great. Uh, That's good. All of our schools have That's environmental good. clubs, and they all want to be involved. Okay, So we see it as an educational process. What we have noticed is you have a 10-year-old or a high school student who work with us. Parents show up now, and they're learning from this. So the other concept that we go with, and I have no idea if this is true, <coughs> but I've read that if you get children involved before the age of 11 mm -hmm. in the mm -hmm. environment, it stays all their life. Mm -hmm. And if you go and look at our board, with all adult. of us did mm -hmm. something with the environment before age 11. I burned a prairie with my parents, Larry planted trees, and it sticks. And we all go back to where we started and look at it every few years to see how it's doing. The same thing will happen here. And I think it'd be really cool, I've got three grandchildren here, I think it'd be really cool for them to grow up and feel that they were part of the entrance. Mm -hmm. That's what I see as our mission here. Yep. Emma? Yes. And just to address an earlier question, what would be a general time estimate uh, from when the conceptual plan would actually be started, with exception of the Buckthorn removal, which is ongoing? Kind of when are we going to put the actual landscape plans into motion? Uh, so meaning when would they start to be installed? Yeah. So I think, um, so first you know, we talked about doing some design work, and before doing design work there would be surveying done, and there would be some design work done on our end, and then we'd be working with you all to present those and get some feedback. Um, you know, it all depends on how much area and, and how much funding gets applied to that. I think, you know, it, it's, you know, we're working on projects now that are going to get installed in the fall of this year. I think, you know, on our end, we can move as fast or as slow as the village wants to, and we are in full support of, of this plan. So if the village wants to install something this fall, I think, you know, we could certainly support that. But I think it's, it's going to be up to... Uh, you all and to the village board to determine how much funding gets applied and to what location. If you can pull up page yeah. 29. Sure, hang on. Uh, there's the section. <coughs> oh, I, 29. I, I think I only go up to 29 20. of the packet Five. online. Okay, then back up yeah. to the one that shows the river in 176. Uh-huh. This one? Yes. Yeah. To me, this, from about here down, would be the perfect starting point. <coughs> because there was a lot of buckthorn in here. Mm -hmm. If that was removed, golf course would pop from everyone coming east on 176. It's a floodplain, so there would not be that much planting that would need to be done right away. Sure. But the visual would be that is such a beautiful area, and it just it gets lost. You have to go back there on foot. There. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Mm -hmm. Let me mention how much work it was. It's a massive. Cottonwoods like this. Yeah. <laughs> talking about cottonwoods? No, I'm talking about well, just getting the buckthorn out of there and the invasives. Yeah. I mean, I don't consider cottonwood an invasive. I mean, we ultimately might want to do it, but. But starting I with think the buckthorn. That would be the first spot. I, that would be stunning, and you know, and if you think about it, coming in from the west, it's like you get the view of you know the come over the tracks and you get the view of the, the new sign to your right and then you can kind of look left and see that vista, it would be fabulous. But, you know, having said that, I would, I would buffer that with the, what I pointed out earlier about your bang for the buck, uh, a continuation or a finalization of the work already being done in the areas that are currently 
open lands has been working, we can get a lot of bang for <coughs> finishing those and getting the concept and then moving it to an area like that. My concern is just the volume of work. Cliff, you're talking about this area? Yeah, I'm talking area. about where it's already yeah. more of a tweak than, a, than an actual build. Mm -hmm. uh, you may find that the sooner you do something of strong impact, of which the river work is, but if you do it across the length, for instance, the fence, uh, the sooner everybody knows something's up, everybody sees you working, people who have no idea you're doing it because they don't go on the websites, nobody has really a local paper they look at much anymore. So doing something strong like the clearing in the river, doing something strong like the fencing, uh, these are the impacts that are going to bring people aboard. I remember I did a project out in the state once, and we didn't even know where the properties were, and the first thing we did was put up the fence, and everybody thought that was the last thing they wanted to do. Once we did it, it completely changed the look of everything, even though nothing changed. <laughs> just the fence went in, but the look, the feel, everything about it changed by just that simple thing. And it may be clearing the river that creates that, it may be the fence, it may be just completing the work on the north side that's already been started. Because mm -hmm. if you go to the farthest west grove right before you hit the river area, you know, that really has the closest look currently as to what's proposed. Uh, it's on the north side, it's before you get, I think it's past the, uh, the Barry Mogul, I think it's Mogul, nature sign. Mm -hmm. uh, but that you can already get a feel for what's going on, but it's lost amongst everything else. So if we were to complete that northern border and start to work on some of that in conjunction with other things, you're going to get a big bang, everybody's going to see what's going on right away. The biggest bang we could ever do, of course, is a budget nightmare, but that's get those lines underground, <laughs> because yes. no, matter, no matter what we yes. do, I mean, if there was <laughs> grant money, if there was somebody who wanted to make a big donation, I, that is yeah, the we've, single most ugly thing on this corridor. It is, it is but I will tell you that we've, we've discussed this before, and I'm an electrical engineer, and so I will tell you that they go out less often when they're underground, but when they go, if they break or fault underground, you're talking a week or two without power. So underground, it looks great, but it's hard to locate and fix. When it's above and the line goes down, you, right there, I got to fix it. And you can do it in a day or two. So the village has talked about it for a long time. I don't disagree with you visually. I'm just saying from uh, keeping the village running. Well, I, I understand that entirely. I've been through that with the college and other villages, but uh, it's, it is just a real problem because no matter what we do, that's an overpowering element that will be very difficult to have any effect. And, uh, perhaps there's some way we can meet in between and do some of it some way or change the poles so they don't look like, you know. Have you seen Fermi Lab? Well, if I go out to, if you, if you go out in the West, the poles are fake trees. And, you know, you don't notice it right away. And the utility boxes are rocks and things like that. I mean, they've gone so much farther than we have. They still have it, but the camouflage or the approach is different. So we're looking at some old telegraph lines or, you know, North Shore electric lines. I mean, it's just a nightmare. And no matter what we do, we should look at ways, or a group of people should look at ways that maybe we can organize it better, maybe we can bury some, keep some, yes. whatever. But it is, no matter what we do, the Achilles heel to this whole project. Yes. At Fermi Lab, the po utility poles are in the shape of pie. The side oh, that's of pie. Oh, yeah. So they're sculptural, which I think is so cool. They are. Yeah. yeah, that's another way to do it, too. So or move them, move them, you know, keep them above ground, but put them on the far southern section of that <coughs> so that, you know, they're not right in your face. Okay, I do want to make sure everyone's had a chance to have any comments or questions. Why don't we go from one side of the committee to another and see if there's any final comments or questions? Nope. I guess my only final comment is kind of uh, echoing sentiments that were expressed earlier about the native plantings, just mm -hmm. making sure that's continued to be emphasized and making sure it's addressed in the introduction, mm -hmm. not only as a model for other communities, but for people living in the community to reference when they're mm -hmm. doing their own landscaping. Thank you. I think it's super. I'll, I'll send a few comments in to you. Uh, for your consideration, sure. not mandatory, but just mainly on the plant list and a couple comments I already mentioned. Thank you. 
Yeah, and if we have a couple days, because I didn't get a chance yeah. to read through everything. That, yeah, yeah. <laughs> so if we I think, I think that's where we're headed. In Absolutely. The There's a motion for the next meeting. And I think maybe just to kind of reinforce what Glenn had mentioned earlier, um, you know, so today is what the fourth, and so we thought, you know, to give everybody 10 days to, to review and then to provide comments to Glenn, and then Glenn would kind of take them all together and then provide them to us, then, then that will give us some time to prepare a refined report that will then go before you for your packets for the meeting on March 4th. Great. There's time. Oh. So, oh. Um, I'm in uh, initial reading of the plant list. I'm an enthusiastic supporter, um, but uh, I also, you know, fair disclosure, I'm sitting here as a member of Union Church and a couple of you in the audience have, and Cliff have worked with us to put in um, on a lot on East Prospect um, a lot of native prairie plantings. So we're so excited to see how that looks. And again, it's another example of this sort of thinking and what can happen in residential areas or close to residential areas. Sure. So I'm, I'm excited to see where we go and look forward to further comments. Um, I would reinforce what Larry said about putting it in the perspective of the county's plan as well, mm -hmm. that this dovetails and supports the county vision mm -hmm. um, for the future. I think that yeah. is helpful. Um, and then I would encourage us to figure out how to be able to release Lobola to move forward and how we can support that. Um, mm -hmm. you know, be it how things are disposed of or money for outright costs or something because they're ready to move forward and we know Buckhorn <coughs> is you know step one so no reason to delay thank you mm -hmm. anyone come up speak give your name if you want to make a comment hi everyone my name is Nels Lutweiler I live at 141 East Switchwood in Lake Bluff and I'd just like to say that for 30 years I've been commuting on the 176 corridor and been frustrated by the morass of buckthorn and invasives that block the view of the golf course and the pond and other things on either side of the roadway. And, um, but I have been encouraged tonight. I'm encouraged with the plan. I'm encouraged with the support and the comments from the committee. But I am also discouraged by the fact that we're talking about more public input, and a survey and you know rehashing the plan and uh, developing the plan where I think we're all in agreement that the most important and most dramatic thing we can do is start eradicating the buckthorn and the invasives and so why don't we just as a committee why don't you go to the village and say hey appropriate some money to have Lobola or whoever start eradicating the buckthorn because Nobody's going to object to that. I mean, that's step one. And I just hate to see this potentially drag on for another year. Why don't we just get going on the most basic thing that needs to get done? And then if we need to talk more about what ultimately what uh, you know, plants get planted or whatever, we can do that down the road. But let's get going on the most basic thing that needs to get done to improve this corridor. It will generate excitement. You know, one thing we could do to what Nell said and what Larry said earlier, uh, we can stage planning too. In other words, we already have a conceptual plan. I already have the whole thing, and Jody does too, in our heads because we've walked this so many times. We could focus on the area that, on the north side there, we're currently <laughs> working, knowing <laughs> where we're going, and we could actually get that to a point that they could start doing something a lot quicker than we would to get the whole plan together mm -hmm. and everything we would do <laughs> over there, we would know as professionals is going to fit into the long-term plan. So having a conceptual plan, when we're doing like a larger project for people, we will often start with the conceptual and then piece the actual final designs, knowing they're all headed to a common goal and they will be connected that way. So we could sort of jumpstart open lands and others moving forward uh, in those areas before we resolve every square inch of every square piece of property. And that would be my recommendation anyway. There's no reason we couldn't be out there flagging, tagging, and laying out within a couple of weeks. Well, I think 
Okay. I think, you know, from the standpoint of this, this committee recommending to the village board and working with the village administration, if you're talking about a phase one design versus phase two, which is all the rest of it, the design, I think it's just a matter of at, at the village staff and the, will have to solicit those quotes from you guys and then we can, as a committee, say to the village board, we strongly recommend you go with a phase one and phase two design so we can get started on some of this stuff. We could also recommend, uh, you're right, there'd be no reason to not start on the Buckthorn because it's, it, it's going to happen, happen no anyway. What? And there's a significant cost and time associated with that. So there may be a, a separate item that's not tied to this key plan of understanding what that cost and time to do that work is. Just that. So I, I think I think village administration needs to put their hat on, but I think that's where I would see it would be going. But we'd have to make a motion first to to um, to incorporate these comments over the next ten days for the next um, committee meeting to accept the report. But I think in the meantime, it could be discussions about um, how to get the next two two or three phases going right away. Bob had a question too. Yeah. Hello, my name is Bob Hurdle with Public Works. I'm the Village Arborist. Uh, looking at the tree planting list, I know it's not set in stone. Um, looking at some of the trees on the list, um, as far as where they are and limitations of the trees, if you look at the prairie crab apple, um, it is intolerant to salt spray. So um, that, that would be a very important thing where you look at planting um, great distance from the roadway. Otherwise, you know, your salt spray goes a long way and then you're, uh, you're not, not looking so good for your, for your healthier trees. They, they have a, a lot of uh, health issues as far as fire blight. Um, Canker scale, they, they have rust issues. It's it's just things you have to, you know, consider. I, I just looked at a few of these right away. Um, the Dami Hawthorn, again, salt spray, uh, health issue. With the crab apple, again, it needs light pruning for health. So we're trying to go low maintenance versus something that needs regular maintenance to stay healthy. Just, just things to look at. Um, I'm really excited about uh, everything that's uh, happening. I work with Larry and do a lot of buckthorn uh, hauling out and uh, <laughs> get that cleared up. Um, as far as uh, good news for the cold weather, um, it could kill as much as 50% of EAB. Mm -hmm. So they don't like temperatures below 20, uh, below 20, minus 20. So nice. you lose a, a lot of your, of your insect, insect population for that. So if there's anything good that came from that, uh, you could lose uh, a lot of uh, the past, so. That's the best news of the night. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, and he brings up a really good point, and that kind of goes to something I've discussed with others in the past, is native does not necessarily mean low maintenance, no problem, no issues. Some of them are the hardest things and require the most chemicals if you want to look good and all this kind mm -hmm. of stuff. Downey Hawthorne's a native. I prefer a dotted Hawthorne, but it's not available in the trade. So downy hawthorn defoliates by August, and it's yeah. very cedar apple rust is on it, on issues regarding that, the fire blight with the crabs. All of this needs to be, you know, winnowed out during the final conversations and stuff. So again, the lists are general, very aware of what you've brought up, and obviously we'd work with you on uh, some of these more detailed observations. But that is something about native plants that I'd like to clear up. Some of them are far harder to take care of than non-natives. So the idea of them needing less water, being easier to deal with and all that, I'd like you to kind of put that aside because some of the hardest plants to go are some of the natives. Some of the easiest plants to grow are non-natives and all you have to do is look at buckthorn. Uh -huh. Of course, not native, <laughs> and it owns the place. So I don't want to, you know, make it sound too much that way. But we do have to take that into consideration when you're looking at, you know, what they have to do from a maintenance point of view. We could actually build a whole lot of maintenance in going native, you know. Mm -hmm. So we have to be very careful in our selections to mm -hmm. get the look of what we want. Well, that and all mm -hmm. the, you know, the right plant in the right place. So if we wanted to go with the buckthorn, for instance, just making sure it's in the right location. 
distance yep. is a very important, you know, sure. thing to think of. So. Mm -hmm. No, super. Yes, Thank you very much. Thanks, Bob. Thanks. Thank you. Okay, anything else? So, um, would someone like to make a motion to incorporate comments and deliver this final report for next meeting? So moved. Second. Second. We'll take a roll call. Sure, give me just a moment. Member Bishop. Aye. Member Sorensen. Aye. Member Twitchell. Yes. Member Patterson. <laughs> Member Johnson? Yes. Uh, Co-Chair Perrier? Yes. Co-Chair Reiner? Yes. And I suppose at that next meeting we would also, or we could make it now, a discussion about recommending to village uh, administration and or board to solicit proposals for the remaining design. Okay. Yep. Is there anything currently in the budget for this, Glenn, do you know? Or um, you know, not specifically. We are coming up on the, our switch into, you know, we're considering our next fiscal year's budget right now. Is so it we, June or July? Um, May 1 is the line, so we May typically 1. adopt it in April. Mm -hmm. okay. So it's a oh, good time okay. to be so it's on the time. subject. Yeah. Okay. Larry, oh, good. can you remind us what um, Labola's costs were? You guys had some m modest costs associated over, with. Uh, over three years. Is this just for the buckthorn removal, or was this? Yes. I think so. Um, it's been corrected. It's forty thousand dollars three years. Yes. But it was also looking for help from with the physical removal and chipping, or it was a partnership with the village and the park district, and uh, what it has been very successful with the clearing of them so far is working with the village to chip the stuff and cut and stack for them. Okay, so the. Forty thousand was out of pocket costs. Yes. Yeah. And that was two years ago. Inflation. <laughs> okay, but it helps us it have a ballpark. Could of we? What, mm -hmm. it, I mean, it included seed, but did, it, it did not include trees and shrubs. Right, but it included the garlong. Yes. Right. And yeah. The herbicide and seeding of the area. Do you need to bring a, a, an updated budget for the next meeting? And then we can include that with the report as a separate agenda item for a recommendation to get started on that the board. to the village board. Thinking about having that ready tonight, but didn't have it. It's okay. It's okay. okay. <laughs> Lastly, I do want to point out that I'm involved with this on other projects, and uh, they are on the same type of situation where it's everybody's pitching in. Uh, we did get private funding for all the design work on, on one of those. So if any of you want to start tapping on the doors there, we could, we could get moving even quicker. And Sophie's <laughs> really good at grant writing. <laughs> there you Marina. go. Sam. She's really good at I that. did send Glenn some info on that grants. That whole process, you know, Lobola, grants, private citizens, you know, that combination, we can get a lot done. Um, for a lot less time and money than it might cost otherwise. Plus we get a higher level of ownership. Ownership. Well, I think that, yeah, and I think that if, if you're going to uh, develop eventually or uh, put together a full design, whether it's a phase one and phase two design, an implementation schedule of how that could be done, you're also gonna have to include some budgetary numbers for each one of those phases because as the village looks at that, they might, there might be questions, well, part four, can that be done by Labola for less? Can part five be done by the garden club? Can, mm -hmm. is this part the village needs to take on and just get it done? You know, the split rail fencing or whatever. So that'll, that'll have to be wrapped into that. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. So real quick jody cliff before you guys leave so just as a refresher we'll incorporate these comments we'll leave the door open until next wednesday for any additional written comments stakeholders the public members of this group we'll bring those back to you in march um, potentially for a recommendation to the village board now the one thing i do to you 
Send them to me, yes. Mm -hmm. One thing I do want to point out is that um, our budgeted scope of services for Jody and Cliff is just about out. Right. Um, unless there's major changes, we are not planning to have them at the March meeting. Okay. Um, if everyone's comfortable with that, just want to make sure there was everyone was aware of that. Okay. okay. So. They'll, they'll review all the comments and yep. pick up what's appropriate. Yep. Good. Super. Okay. Thank you. What, thank you. Thank you. What, when is the March meeting? March 4th? Uh, the first Monday in March. I think it's the 4th again. March yes. 4th. Okay, 7 p.m. Every March then. Okay, let's go back to the agenda. Yes. We have seven minutes before Sophia's pickup. I have less than seven minutes. <laughs> I worked minutes it to out. Talk. I'm good. Okay, all right, let's go. <laughs> Thank you, let's Marina, go. though. Okay, fast, brief, high level, and we'll get on out of here. Um, first, uh, I have three items under my staff report. Mr. Chairman, this is co-chairman, mm -hmm. co-double, co Whatever. you got me. <laughs> um, first on the um, sustainability plan that's been around for a while, I think I have written it as far as I know how to write it. So um, I've got it um, circulating internally and, and with some others for some peer review. I'm hoping that I will take um, the corridor plan from you and in turn give you a sustainability plan right about an exchange there okay. and have some time for discussion um, in March. Awesome. So I think it weighs in. It, it's long enough right now. So um, hopefully we'll have a, a chance for some good discussion there. Um, on that topic, um, tomorrow night I am in front of the Architectural Board of Review with some items from this committee. Um, so I'm there talking about um, our plans for bike racks in the Central Business District, talk about some design choices. Um, I'll be there to mention the corridor and gateway plan and we'll hand out some copies to that group as well. And then um, we'll be talking about some good chunks of the sustainability plan, talk about work that group does in reviewing commercial site plans. So when we talk about um, landscaping, when we talk about street furniture and, and bicycle racks and private property, when we talk about lighting, almost all of our dark mm -hmm. sky related policies, um, that group is pretty central to that. So um, I'll be making that report and having a discussion with them. Um, we'll bring you back some information in, uh, in March. And then finally, I do have one piece of paper here on the dais for you. As you know, there is a um, sort of an independent group called Green Minds of Lake Forest and Lake Bluff mm -hmm. that has been talking about a, a waste app, a recycling app, I think mm. is, is the right term. So nice. if I have this thing, where can I go recycle it? Where can I take it? Oh, that's when a is great my stuff idea. Nice. Yeah. So um, we, they've approached us to have some discussions about data exchange today. We thought it would be ah. a great time to bring this to you and make you aware of it. Um, so, we, so it's up and running? Or? It is not up and running. This is still in the conceptual, conceptual. phases okay. that they're developing. Okay. Um, so I wanted to make you aware of that. I'd say personally, I'm, I, I wish it wasn't just Lake Forest and Lake Bluff. I wish, you know, for how close it is for just being a Swalco initiative, I would wish Mm -hmm. it, it would just be, be at that higher yeah. level, mm -hmm. but um, we'll, we'll see where this Take goes. Take it, yeah. Okay. Um, I love it. I wanted to mention that Gorton uh, has a program on solar power on Wednesday evening from 7 to 8.30, um, and it's, a, um, it's about the new law making it easier for residents and businesses to benefit from solar energy so um, mm -hmm. the um, Lake Forest Collaborative for Environmental Leadership is hosting the forum a okay. couple of quick things um, speaking of forums NASA climate change and you can find that on Facebook or online uh, this Wednesday will present their updated report on global temperatures based on new data and their, um, their thoughts on what's happening with climate change. It's an online free uh, seminar that will happen Wednesday, this Wednesday at I believe 1030 Central. Um, I do want to come back to the board with an additional update on resiliency. Um, I've had some talks within my company um, about there's uh, about what towns can do to um, include building standards and codes so that as we go forward, our buildings and our infrastructure are designed to uh, cope with minus 23 degree 
and then floods, and then 110 degrees. Did you have a problem with that? <laughs> I didn't, <laughs> because my house is resilient. Um, but uh, that's something I like to bring up as well. And then on the immediate, as uh, Glenn discussed, as the immediate next steps I think the, the committee is going to be looking at is we talked about the lighting, model lighting ordinance and mm -hmm. dark skies. Mm -hmm to start taking to the next step where we're going to start marking up the model lighting ordinance and then sending that to the village board or architectural board or planning for comments and thoughts to see if we can get that incorporated into the village. And then moving forward, obviously, with the bike plans, which include may include, let's put some bike racks here at first to see how everyone likes the new bike racks and then look at larger implementations of different racks and maybe bike paths around town. Super. I wanted to mention that Go Green Illinois, um, the group that covers the whole suburbs, we got the gold star at the meeting. We were called out as Lick Bluff being the only community right now that is offering scrap pickups throughout the entire year. Nice. And no one else on the North Shore is, um, has that. They only have it in the summer. Really? So it was quite interesting. Um, Evanston has just voted in. They want to be completely um, free of, um, not, not waste, but they- What waste? All waste. They want to completely have composting 100% by um, 2025. Do we have any idea how many people are participating? It would be nice to have a report update on that. Sure, so we've looked into that. Um, I think I mean, Leslie you... <laughs> actually possesses the best information in the world on this subject, yeah. whether you believe it or not. I guess I Thank do. Because I asked the same question of Glenn before I went to the meeting to say how many of our people in our community are, are actually using it, and there's no way to tell right, without digging in everyone's going bags. and looking in their bags. <laughs> However, that's exactly what Highland Park did. They hired their interns last summer, oh. and for Several weeks in a row, the interns went through all of the uh, bags that were turned in, oh. and um, in the summer only, and they found that two percent of their population is actually doing it. And so Highland Park has a similar program, or they were going through our garbage? No, <laughs> <laughs> for, they went through their own garbage. Their own, okay. And they told their community what people were doing going through their garbage. And uh, they found that they need to do a lot more um, hmm. education. To education because people don't know what they can do and how to use I it. I must say I had to stop my um, composting last week because I couldn't get my compost bin open. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Small problem. vortex yeah. issues. Yeah. yeah, I did too. Yeah, the same it's a problem. It was frozen, <laughs> yeah. But anyway, it was, it was very nice to hear us called out as being the top community in this We do a lot. With, we've done a lot with waste over the last couple of years. Mm -hmm. Really, we've done a great job. Do we send out, um, I don't remember, I'm asking the question because I don't remember, an annual reminder or how can we promote this concept? In sure. The dialogue? Hmm? Dialogue or what, the president's newsletter yeah so I think it I think we do have a mention of it in the uh, you know there's a quarterly newsletter um, mm -hmm. that's sent out mm -hmm. um, I think I actually mentioned just it, arrived but, yeah, yeah this time around mm -hmm. um, so when we first rolled out the service in 17 with a mailing to all um, mm -hmm. households right and um, we talked we actually talked about doing it in conjunction with this newsletter but it's it's got a relatively high price for bang for the buck mm -hmm. um, it's some somewhere in the neighborhood of I think fifteen hundred to two grand to do it again. Mm. Um, so we're trying to look at um, oh to do a other, complete to mailing. do another mailer. That that number was actually just to have a tear off in the um, in the newsletter that was already going off. Oh. So tear it off, okay. put it on the fridge. So we wanted to try some um, other ways of refreshing that yeah. um, before we committed to that. Yeah, yeah, it's it's okay. been brought up before, and I know it's a village issue and it's a farmers market issue, but I really wish the village was able to have some informational stands on the village green during the farmer's market. Well, maybe there's space now. What? Maybe there's space now. It's a, it's a contractual issue we have with the farmer's market and ordinance issue. It seems odd that we can't 
talk about our own stuff. Well, maybe, <laughs> maybe the but in viral yeah. club could do it. Oh, absolutely. Actually, Why couldn't they do it? No, no, no. You don't understand that the ban in the farmer's market is based on no person who's not selling and as part of the farmer's market may be on the green. So that what they were originally trying to do is not turn it into a political action. action. Mm. But they over, I think they overreached with the approach in saying that even the village's own internal government may not. Because <laughs> I was thinking, you know, originally, you know, the fire, the, fire, the fire department could have a stand on smoke detectors and the kids could right. up and, yeah. you know, and we could have something on the different types of waste you can do. I mean, that's not a political thing. Why don't that's we just change the ordinance? That was my recommendation. Is it to an the ordinance board. or is it a contract? It, it's, it's an agreement with the farmers market that would ha when when it's renewed and it's renewed every year, right? So that should be yeah, it should mm -hmm. be something we that could be changed. Can you talk to them? Because I know the garden club was able to get yeah. cable one summer, and um, we, we kind of told them what we needed to what we were going to do every week, mm -hmm. but they let us. Do that. Because so part of it, it's not, you, we can be on this corner. You can be on everybody. We, we yeah. did that. I was on the corner with the chicken. With the chicken. Yeah, the we chicken. hung out Sorry. with the chicken. The chicken tried to get away. <laughs> the chicken did get away. So, and I think you were left by that point. No, I don't know if you ever heard that story. No, it did happen on our watch. I don't know what happened to your chicken. Okay. I just kept thinking of the whole turkey thing all over I'd like again. to oh, call for adjournment. Oh, I have one quick Oh, wait. Okay. Talk. Oh, sorry. Quick. Go, um, Emma. I'd so like for those who are interested, the Lake, uh, Lake Forest High School Environmental Commission is looking for community members to come in and get involved. And we're essentially making a sustainability plan for the high school. Um, oh, nice. So I thought this would be the forum to bring that up. So if anyone's interested, I can give you my email after the meeting. Um, we're going to have meetings a couple times a month till the end of the school year, and then going on to next year, hopefully there are going to be people who are going to keep it going. So, yeah. Awesome. Nice. <laughs> That's my plug. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Can I get a motion to adjourn? Motion. So moved. Second. All in favor? Aye. 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 <laughs> Thanks, everyone. It's a good meeting. Thank you. Thank you. Oh, I was, okay. Really? Okay. I'm going to give it to you. Um, Here, I'll give you her email. Here,